Thank you, Buenos Aires. It's very nice to be here. Um, I have to turn this off. My first time in Costa Rica. Thank you very much uh, for the organizing committee for inviting me. It's a, a great pleasure to be here and to listen to the, um, some exciting presentations. I very much enjoyed that last presentation and the visit to the laboratory. Um, it seems to me that the, the country is focused on trying to develop excellence in everything you do with pavement technology and materials. So with that, thank you, for, thank you and I will go through my presentation. I want to talk a little bit about uh, the design considerations for asphalt binders. And I, I want to uh, discuss and give you some of tools to assess the quality of modified binders. Look at some of the tools that we should really be trying to implement today and things that we need to consider for the future. So I'm going to talk about asphalt modification. Uh, here in my presentation, I use the word asphalt. I think uh, you would use the word bitumen. In America, we treat the liquid glue as, as asphalt, uh, whereas in Europe and the rest of the world, it's uh, bitumen. I'm originally from the UK, so for me, bitumen is, is also acceptable, but in the US and this presentation, we'll use the word asphalt. Um, what I want to do is show you some of the things that I've accounted over the years and uh, just give you a bit of perspective on the design of, uh, of, of modified asphalt. If you look at the historical aspects of asphalt modification, we've been modifying asphalt for well over 100 years. Uh, we can uh, uh, look at the uh, definitions and uh, how we've been modifying materials. Uh, but materials like Trinidad Lake Asphalt, some of these old modifiers have been around for a considerable number of time. We've been modifying materials in, in oils and also the refinery processes going back to the early 1900s. Asphalt rubber has been used since the 1950s and many, many other materials have been, been used uh, over the years. So the question is, is why do we do it? Well, first of all, to think about why we do it, we have to consider what asphalt or bitumen is. It's a residual from the refinery process. It's a natural uh, material. Um, and uh, it's, uh, as that material has been refined over the years, the process has become more and more complex. If you look in this slide here, you can see, uh, you know, generally speaking, asphalt will flow like a liquid. And the refinery process, this is showing a, a sort of an old refinery process, more typical of uh, 20, 30 years ago. And the residual coming out of the, uh, the, the vacuum cracker there will be the asphalt that was used uh, in, in our normal process. Typically oil refineries, and this is in Beaumont in Texas, uh, will produce the, the bitumen that we're looking at. Here, I'm showing an old natural asphalt. This is a, a photograph I took when I was down in Trinidad a few years back, and uh, Trinidad produces one of those natural asphalts that's been used for many years. So we have the choice of uh, natural or refined products uh, that can be used in, in, in road pavements. However, as we go over the years, asphalt and bitumen, or I should really say bitumen, has become significantly more complex. This is the old process on the left side here, and here we have our old asphalt that we would be refining coming out of the, uh, the vacuum unit. Uh, this would be what we call the short residual, and this would be how we define old asphalt. Today, we might add on other units. We might have vis breakers, we might have cokers, we might, have, um, we might take out more fuel oil, we might have propane deasphalting units. And uh, this then gives us a very different asphalt. Um, the amount of asphaltines in the uh, bitumen has gone down. The asphalt has become harder. The chemistry of those asphaltines have changed themselves. So the bitumen that we use today is different to what it was 20 years ago. 
And then we come along and we might add other materials to it. We'll use modifiers. We might use re-refined engine oil bottoms or other material that's been re-refined and then put back into the bitumen and then that final product is sold as a bitumen. So the asphalt is quite different. What we see today to what we maybe used 20 years ago and more. This slide I took uh, from one of the old, pub, old um, PowerPoint presentations that were developed at the time of Sharp. Um, Sharp was the Strategic Highway Research Program. It was conducted in the US in the late 1980s, early 1990s. And I was one of the researchers, uh, along with Bill Butler and various other people, um, who was uh, involved in that research program back then. And one of the comments and the justification for developing that research program was this comment here, with the, the guy saying, the, the asphalt has changed. Somebody has taken all the stickies out of the uh, bitumen that we're using and the chemistry has changed. But if you really think about it, back in round about 1990 time period, the bitumen really hadn't changed. We had gone through the Arab oil embargo in the 1970s, but the basic refinery processes in the, in the, in the 1980s, 1970s, 1980s had not really changed very significantly. Some changes were around, but they were generally not widely implemented. However, if you look at the changes in chemistry today, they are significant changes. We have the implementation of mega refineries, uh, and the mega refineries produce virtually no bitumen. The residual content coming out of those refineries is on average 1%. Whereas the classic old style refineries, the residual contents coming out of those are in the range of 10 to 20%. So this means that the asphalt that we're using today, or the bitumen, has changed in terms of uh, how we see the chemistry today to what existed during the original sharp research work and what we were using 20, 30 years ago. So what we have to do, and we see this work going on in your laboratory here, is we have to understand how the chemical indices we see coming out of the um, the, the behavior of the bitumen are related to the rheology. So we have to understand the chemical and the rheological impact. Uh, this, uh, for your information here, is a, um, a split, what we call the SARA analysis. It splits the asphaltines into the uh, four commonly used fat fractions, the saturates, the aromatics, the resins, and the asphaltines. We have to understand this chemistry to understand the, the performance of the bitumen. These photographs I took out of a recent AAPT paper um, in March this year, and uh, they were showing some of the structures that you see in asphalt. Some folks have commented on these bee-like structures you see when you zoom in on the uh, asphalt fractions. The older way of looking at asphalt fractions might be to look at a asphalt binder behaving like a sole material, going to a, a gel type structure. As the asphalt ages, you see the fractions in the asphalt uh, changing. The slide here shows the, uh, some structures, uh, asphaltines and resins um, in, the, in an asphalt structure under a, uh, a scanning microscope. Now the important thing is, is that we know that the chemical composition can be related to performance. The de degree of the structuring in, that you see in the asphalt is significantly related to the performance of those asphalt fractions. Now what we need to be able to do is to tie that rheology with changes in performance to temperature and then on to pavement performance. So this is sort of one of the, the goals in terms of our understandings. When we design our asphalt binders, we need to be, have very careful selections of the components that meets the current specification parameters. That being said, we need to carefully include newer binder test parameters. And there's a few of these that we need to look at, a few things that have been developed recently. There's a parameter which is called delta TC, and I'll explain what this is in a few minutes. It's related to cracking. Okay? It's also related to the chemistry. The low R value, uh, which is a rheological index, um, is, is, is preferable for resistance to cracking. 
Uh, we can use things like the gas dull index. That's related to the, um, the saturates and the asphaltene content divided by the aromatics and the resins. Um, we know that the sol binders uh, have the low R values and the gel binders have the high R value. And all of these things can be tied to the delta TC. The other parameter is a parameter called the Glover Rho parameter. This was work that was originally developed by Charles Glover, and uh, now it has my name tacked on there as well. Um, but we've been looking at that parameter as well as the delta TC for trying to understand both conventional and modified binders. And so far, we found that it works fairly well uh, for all the binders that we've looked at, including, including rubberized asphalts. So what these two parameters do is they allow us to understand the effect of stiffness and relaxation properties with the binders, and I'll talk more about this in, in a few minutes. What we have to do is make sure that we, when we design our binders, that we design our binders that they're fit for purpose and that they don't just pass the current specification requirements. And we, we do need to do some additional work, and the understanding that we have today is only part of the answer, and we will be uh, changing uh, this as, as time goes along. Some additional work is still needed. So the reason why we modify is what we want to do is we want to ad address um, deficiencies in specification compliance. For example, if you have an asphalt binder or bitumen that doesn't meet the specifications, you can modify this to meet, uh, meet the re requirements. You can address the deficiencies in performance. Uh, enables us to use products that may not otherwise be suitable, and it enables us to add value and to extend margins on our products. So these are the basic reasons that why we're typically uh, modifying uh, bitumens. The picture here is a road in New Mexico, which was a design-build road done in the, um, uh, the early 2000s uh, by Coke Materials. And they were very much into developing binders, so in their P3-type products, they can limit their, their risks and uh, build high-quality uh, pavements. Many different types of uh, asphalt modification processes exist. We can uh, look at um, examples such as uh, uh, propane precipitated asphalt, PPA, um, which is a, a, something that's been around since the 1970s. There's a rose process where you uh, basically split the uh, components of the asphalt apart and then recombine them. Uh, so there's various types of uh, examples of, of this. We can produce oxidized grades in Russia and the, uh, uh, the, the, this old Soviet system. They call these BND grades. And then we can add other materials. Uh, instead, we can change uh, the material that we're using by adding polymers, uh, waxes, resins. Uh, we can add oils and powders, various types of things, anti-strip additives, extenders, etc. Now, I put this list on here, um, just uh, uh, not as a list that I'm going to talk about each one of these because we would still be here until dinner, let alone lunch. Um, so it, it, what I really want to do is say that asphalt modification is a, is a complex process. There's many different materials we can use. Okay, this is a, a partial list um, of, of modifiers. And typically, when we use a, do an asphalt modification today, we might use one modifier, we might use two, we might use three modifiers. We're really developing an engineered binder. So we, we might typically be taking, say, an, an SBS, we might be taking a bit of polyethylene, we might be using an oil, just for an example. And people are designing binders that have those three components in, or more, for um, asphalt paving applications and other applications in which um, uh, bituminous products are used in. I'll put these uh, uh, links here, and I should say, if anybody wants a copy of my presentation, I'll make this available. If this needs to be circulated, I'm very happy for this to be circulated. These two links here show some recent publications by, uh, they're available through the Asphalt Institute, 
Uh, one deals with PPA. Well, in this case, PPA isn't propane precipitated asphalt, but rather it is polyphosphoric acid. Unfortunately, in the asphalt industry, we have PPA meaning two different things. In the 1980s, it was propane precipitated asphalt. In the 2000s, it's now become poly polyphosphoric uh, acid. Uh, Reob is uh, recycled engine oil bottoms. And this has caused us many problems in the USA recently with premature cracking in asphalt binders. Uh, there's a concern both in the US, Canada, and Europe about the use of uh, Reob in materials. So this is something we need to be aware of. The other thing that I'll mention to you is there's uh, various uh, journals and, and information uh, that exists um, uh, through international conferences. I'm very involved with the Association of Asphalt Paving Technologists. We have the Peterson Asphalt Conference. Uh, Bill's uh, uh, editor of the uh, Road Materials and Pavement Design uh, Journal. Uh, there's many good journals like this, so if you want some suggestions about where to get materials, I can, I can help with, with that. Uh, as you choose. But when we think about it, we have to ask ourselves, what is the ideal binder? So I would say this, for a given climate, okay, and the climate here in Costa Rica is a little bit different to uh, certain parts of North America, um, but we need to have a material that at the lower pavement temperatures has good flexibility, uh, low stiffness and good relaxation properties to resist cracking. Now, your low pavement temperatures here are a little bit different to our low pavement temperatures, but you still need those properties at your lower pavement temperatures. At high pavement temperatures, we have to have sufficient stiffness and elastic properties that permanent flow doesn't occur. And one of the comments that we heard on the last presentation is those slow-moving trucks going up those steep grades. This is a very real issue. I was in Tanzania three or four weeks ago, and we had exactly the same problems there in Tanzania, where you take those slow-moving trucks going up those steep grades, and we had ruts six inches deep. Uh, major problem in those areas. So we need to really design our products for those, those considerations. Uh, we have to be able to compact and lay our materials, uh, so we want sufficient mobility to allow compaction to occur. Uh, mixing temperatures, we want adequate flow and coating properties so that we can mix uh, our properties. Now, um, ideally, these properties shouldn't change their performance with age. We would like to have the same properties today as if we do in 20 years' time. If we can got no aging, well, that's, be that's the, best, the best situation. I'm using this old chart to sort of illustrate how we might see these properties. This is a bitumen test data chart from Hoekleman. This was published in the uh, 1970s by the researchers in uh, Shell Oil. And um, this is a, a, a chart that combines bitumen uh, penetration on a, a scale over here. You have temperature on this scale, viscosity on this scale, a point for softening point here, and a frass breaking point there. It enables us to put all our empirical data on a single plot. And if you look at a chart like this, a bitumen will normally have a slope. Uh, a typical bitumen will have a, a flat line or a flat slope like this uh, going across the uh, chart, or I should say a diagonal slope. And ideally what we want to do with modification is flatten this part out, keep this part still a bit steep, so this part will be good for low temperature performance. Here's your rutting and deformation performance. And then you want to drop the viscosity so you can mix and compact. And that's sort of an easy way of explaining it, um, pre the use of dynamic shearometers and, and rheology. But we, we want to achieve the same type of properties with our new testing and our rheology. In terms of how much modifier we add to a material, we have to remember that these relationships with modifiers aren't linear. And uh, I've just shown this as an example. This is showing the amount of SBS polymer uh, going in a material on the horizontal axis and the change in softening point on the vertical axis. And you can see as you add the material, all of a sudden you get a sudden jump. This is as the network structures and the interactions occur. So with additives, you don't get a linear relationship. And with many additives, there's actually an optimum amount of that additive you want to add. It might be 5%, it might be a bit more, but there are optimum amounts of additive uh, that we need to consider. If you add too much of some additives, that can then be bad for the binder. So we have to design our binders very carefully uh, with those sorts of considerations. 
Our modern tools today, we have things like dynamic shear rheometers, bending beam rheometers. We saw several of these in the lab here. Um, but we can, we can get better information today uh, by measurements of things like the complex modulus, G star times sine delta, G star divided by sine delta. But we can also do the testing at additional temperatures and frequencies. So we can produce things like master curves, which we saw a few minutes ago for the mixture work. And this enables us to understand the viscous and the elastic response over a wide range of uh, conditions. So having that information is extremely useful today for the design of these binders. This is, I'm going to take a couple of minutes and explain what we have on this graph. But these, this graph here on the top uh, right-hand side shows a master curve. Um, on the, the vertical axis here, I have the complex modulus. This is really the stiffness of the binder, uh, the stress divided by the strain, uh, the stiffness of the material. Here I have frequency, which is the speed of loading. So that slow truck going up the hill would be down here, fast traffic would be over here. Here I have the phase angle, so this green line is the phase angle, this one is the complex modulus. The phase angle is how much viscous behavior is captured in that asphalt binder. So a graph like this can tell you the contribution of elastic behavior, the contribution of viscous behavior over a large range of loading times or frequencies if you look at a graph like this. We then combine this with some shift factors and that also allows us to get the effects with respect to temperature. There's a couple of values here I've shown. This value from a point where the phase angle equals 45 degrees. So here's a phase angle 45 degrees. This characteristic here is what we call the R value. It's the rheological index. That rheological index relates to delta TC. It relates to the uh, gas still index. It re relates to the amount of asphaltines. It relates to the whether you've got a sol or a gel binder, it relates to the critical cracking temperature of the binder. This thing relates to so much as a characteristic of the binder. Where this point lies, uh, crossover frequency, tells us about is the, is the asphalt binder got a certain hardness, and so it relates to the hardness of the material. If you take certain asphalt binders, I mean, this is, I'm showing uh, several of these um, uh, plots like this, in this case transpose so that I'm plotting the G star against the phase angle and each of these uh, curves here represents a binder with a different R value or rheological index. This would be more of a sol binder, this one would be more of a blown binder or a lightly oxidized binder. So when you look at the rheological information you can start to tell almost immediately things about the production process of a binder. And the same wise, if you have information about the chemistry, you can sort of start to guess some of the information about how the binder is physically going to form. Some folks have developed very good procedures for doing this. The work at WRI can basically nearly predict your G star and your phase angle. If you put in some chemistry information, they can calculate all of this. So this is the way the industry is going. We're going to be developing this information and we're going to have very good information about doing it. One other thing I want to mention before we go on is this is all in the linear domain. This is really dealing with things like cracking um, and performance at reasonably high traffic speeds. When we need to consider permanent deformation, we really have to go to the nonlinear domain to consider tests such as the multi-stress creep recovery test. So we can't always rely on tests in the linear region when we're looking at deformation and permanent deformation of asphalt mixes. The tools we have, okay, the tools we have, uh, the, you know, we have specifications. We have the Ashto specifications in the US. It tells us G star over sine delta. We have the Ashto specification based on high temperatures. If you ask me, um, are these specifications adequate for understanding a performance of our modified asphalts? I would say no. These specifications are limited at best, okay? And that was really the reason that I put that earlier comment on there, that we need to consider other parameters as well. The standards that we have and we're using today were based upon uh, the materials that were evaluated in the late 1980s, early 1990s. So the materials that we evaluated and based those standards on have changed today. So we need, need to be continually thinking about adding and changing our specifications as we go along. 
The challenge is, is how do we define and characterize uh, binders? In the SHARP program, we did limited work on modified binders. It did leave us with some very useful tools uh, for further understanding. We have to consider the distress areas. We have to consider aging. What other improvements should we use? What things we should do today? Uh, what work do we need to do? You know, this, this photograph here, this series of photographs, I, I took when I was in Turkey. We were setting up a polymer-modified asphalt plant. And um, when we got the binder to the lab, and they, they said to me, they can't get any decent results with the binder in the lab. And I looked at the binder, and it looked like this. It looked like black cottage cheese, it lumpy. And I said, well, this is crazy. You're taking this binder to the lab, and you're testing it. So we developed a new test. This is called the hand stretch test. We took a, a piece of bitumen and we stretched it just to make sure that we've got no lumps. And it, you know, sometimes there's so many practical things that we need to do which are almost stupidly simple before we even get the material to the lab. But anyway, um, I'm gonna go on from that, but that's the story behind those uh, few photographs there. The two main considerations that we have to think about is, is the deformation, the rutting, and the cracking. Uh, deformation, rutting is to do with flow, uh, cracking, whether we consider fatigue cracking, durability cracking, low temperature thermal cracking, it's all cracking. So we, we just have to think about those, those two major distresses. Um, we, we, we want this. This is my New Mexico road. We don't want this. Uh, this was uh, uh, the road, one of the roads in Tanzania I took a picture of a couple of weeks back. Uh, this is an old, old picture that I just had. So we want to try to uh, uh, limit the, uh, uh, the, the deformation and the cracking and have good performance. So the improvements we should, need, should, should be looking at and making to, today. We should be implementing this Delta TC in our specifications. Very useful for understanding and helping us with things like um, uh, wrap content, which is recycled asphalt pavement. And I would suggest that we need to strongly consider this Glover Row parameter as well. So I'm going to go in the next few slides and just look at uh, what the Delta TC is and what the Glover Row parameter is. And then I want to mention what I mean by point versus shape parameters. So Delta TC is from the bending beam rheometer. Um, and what we do in the bending beam rheometer is this is, well, let me explain the graph. Uh, this is the stiffness on the vertical axis temperature on the horizontal axis. The four curves here represent different aging conditions. This is an unaged material, and this is 80 hours in the PAV, 20 hours, and I think 40 hours in the PAV. And if you take the temperature at which you uh, where you have the stiffness of 300 megapascals, and deduct from that the temperature of where the M value equals 0.3, so this square box, these square boxes here represents where the M value was 0.3, and if you deduct this, this number from this number, you have the delta TC. So in this case, the delta TC is a small positive value, and in this case, the delta TC is a reasonably large negative value. And it's a shape parameter. As materials oxidize, the delta TC becomes more negative, and um, you know, sometimes it starts as a small positive value, sometimes a small negative value, and as the material oxidizes, it gets to be more negative. Ideally, we do not want a delta TC, which is gonna be over something like about minus five. So we want it to be minus five and above rather than minus five and below. So that's sort of the limit on that. Um, if you look at this, uh, and this shows some cracking data from Tom Bennett at Rutgers University, uh, here we have an overlay test where you have a number of cycles as you uh, open and close a, a test specimen. Um, here you have a lot of cycles, so the material is quite good. Here you have very few cycles, so the material is bad. And on this axis is the delta TC. So you see with these large negative delta TCs, that material cracks very quickly. And uh, th this is the reason why uh, we want to control this Delta TC. So if you have a cracking issues with binder here in Costa Rica, I would say Delta TC is a parameter we should look at. Some folks have feel that, well, I don't have real cold temperatures, why do I need to use a bending beam rheometer? But what the bending beam rheometer does, it gives you a characterization of the stiffness of the binder in the high stiffness region. 
And regardless of your climatic zone, your binders will still oxidize to that high stiffness region. So the characterization of the stiffness, even though you might not have minus 20 or minus 10 degrees temperatures here, is still valid because you're measuring the stiffness of the material in that region. Um, as materials age, we'll see um, that, that oxidation increases. This one is looking at uh, Glover Rho on this, on this axis here. Glover Rho is a, a parameter uh, which is, includes the G star and the phase angle. So on this plot here, you'll see G star and phase angle. And this is looking at one of the, or those same binders on the previous slide. As that material ages, um, the the material will get stiffer, the G-star will increase, the phase angle will reduce, and eventually it will cross this, this damage zone. Here we have no cracking, and here we have cracking, and the material will age and crack. If we're adding oils such as rejuvenators or uh, we're using high wrap contents, we can use a process where we look at the R value versus the crossover frequency in this plot here. The materials as they age and oxidize will always move in one direction. If you want to rejuvenate, you will always move in the other direction. So by using rheology, we have some very useful tools for helping us understand and design our asphalt binders. This, is, this slide here shows the, um, the Glover Rho parameter on the vertical axis versus the delta TC on the horizontal axis. When we did the original work, and this was work conducted by Mike Anderson uh, back in uh, about six or seven years ago, this was published in 2011 in AAPT, he had these red data points here. You see these red data points and these lines here? And the, the answer that we, we thought we had was, hey, this is great, we have a single relationship for defining all our materials. Uh, Delta CC is tied very nicely to the Glover Rho parameter, and we have some single, a single relationship. But then I plotted the sharp binders on this. The sharp binders are, are a line that moves like this. And then we looked at polymer modified binders. These two are an SBS polymer modified from Russia. This is Arizona, uh, sorry, this is uh, Florida crumb rubber mixes. And they're all on the underside of the line. If you look at some very complex uh, binders made with very hard asphalt, they're above the line. So all of a sudden we realize, well, this isn't a single relationship. And really this is the concept that this parameter here is measuring a point a prop property. So it's measuring a point at a single loading time and a single frequency. This parameter here is measuring a slope parameter. If we think about how our binder specifications have traditionally been put together over the years, we either have in our specification two point parameters or a point and a softening, a point and a slope parameter. So two point parameters would be a pen and a softening point. A point and a slope parameter would be a pen and a penetration index. We never developed historically a specification that just has one slope parameter. So we'd never have a, spe a specification that just says penetration index. So what this means is that we can't rely on delta TC alone. We have to have delta TC and some parameter to anchor it with to really understand our binder performance. And this is uh, some examples of point parameters and slope parameters. And we've always used two or three of these parameters in our specification to fully capture the temperature and time dependency of the, of the, of the material. I put this slide on here. and. Um, uh, what we need to do is we need to be able to provide the linkage and cause of, of cause and effects. Aging and cracking, um, we are looking at these parameters at the moment, the delta TC, the Glover Rho, G star time, sine delta, linear amplitude sweep tests, other tests to try to decide where we're going. I don't think we've quite got there yet, but when we're designing asphalt binders, we know that at the moment we have two or three very useful parameters that we need to consider. And, and certainly in the formulation work that I do around the world, these are parameters that I'm advising my clients uh, that we need to consider. Um, one of the other aspects is when we look at the mixing and compaction temperatures, uh, are we really concerned about viscosity or lubricity? 
Uh, lubricity is a new term. It's been introduced into the asphalt world in the past um, six or seven years. And uh, this uh, deals with how the surface characteristics of a film affects the compaction. Viscosity is a bulk property. It's the bulk viscosity of the film. Lubricity is a surface uh, effect. Uh, if you look, this, uh, th this type of plot is in the uh, patent disclosures for things like EvoTherm. Um, so you'll see that EvoTherm folks will use this as a justification for their products. Um, other folks like Hussein Bahir uh, and his team in the University of uh, uh, Madison uh, in, up in Wisconsin have been using this approach as well. Uh, so there's a few folks looking at this uh, understanding, trying to understand materials. And this is something that I think is going to be quite important uh, as we go uh, over the next few years. Uh, what we have to do is we have to make sure we think outside the box. If you think of your specification as your box, make sure you think outside it. Okay? We have to do more than what is written in the specification if we're going to make good products. I always like to think of a specification as the lowest common denominator that everybody agreed to and they put it into a document. If we really want to make good products, we really have to very carefully understand uh, how those products behave and really try to think outside the box. It puts a lot of responsibility on material suppliers uh, to try to develop uh, the products. And we need to, as specifiers, try to incorporate many of these things to safeguard us, to make sure that we uh, can build good pavements. So the modification concept, uh, with all of that said, is basically we take a base binder, we make sure it's soft enough to resist cracking. We may need to soften with oils. We'll check the delta TC. We'll uh, look at the Glover row. And then we modify the high end with polymer to stiffen the high temperatures. We'll use cross-linking, we'll use PPA, we might use some other materials in limited amounts. And it's a complex process, but we're trying to meet all of those uh, different parameters. But finally, I've got two slides here um, coming up, and it's my last two slides. And I want to say binder is only part of the process, okay? Uh, I took this uh, photograph in, this was uh, actually in Tanzania about five or six years ago when I was over there. And this was a quarry that was being used, and uh, uh, they were taking uh, material from, from this face, and they were taking material from this face. And I said to them, how are you controlling, you know, blending those two different types of rock? One was black and one was nearly white, okay? Uh, clearly different specific gravities, and they said, no, oh, we just put it all in a pile. We might mine from over there one day and mine from over there the next day. They were using modified binders. We had an Elvaloy uh, modified binder over there. It was a great binder, but they had rutting. If you don't control all your processes, you will have problems, okay? Uh, so part of the binder is just part of the story. We have to make sure that we, we really um, uh, do the whole job. We, don't, we must not forget the mixture. And I put all of these mixture tests on here. Uh, you know, we have various things we can look at for uh, rutting or uh, water damage or cracking type tests. We cannot not treat the, the mixture as the final product that we're laying. Binder is only part of the story. We can relate binder performance very nicely to mixture, but it's only part of the story. And, um, this is another example, end of truckload segregation. This was up in uh, per, uh, Chile uh, last year I took this picture. We have to lay the material right. We, we can't rely on uh, uh, just uh, having a good, a good mix. Every one of those arrows where it points to that end of truckload segregation, that will be a point where that material will fail early. And then finally, I put this one on. Um, I think this is the PDF rather than the PowerPoint. Uh, the PD when I put the PowerPoint one on first, you'll I show a picture of the paver and everything. Everything looks good. And, uh, and then eventually you get to the rolling and you see we have roller cracking here. If you can't lay the mixture right and you end up putting too heavy a rollers on and just cracking it, then again, we're going to end up with all sorts of problems. Uh, the calibrations that were presented in the, in the software pavement design mean nothing because what you started out was with a cracked road to begin with. And when we build our roads, we have to make, pay every attention to every detail. Um, never assume that everything is done correctly, but 
go and make sure that we don't have this type of situation occurring in, 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 in our roads. So that's a, a, a sort of some comments on uh, modified binders and design of mixes. Uh, thanks very, very much for, for listening. I do have my card on here. If anybody wants a copy of this presentation, I'm very happy to email it, and I'm certain Lewis will make it uh, available to everyone. So thank you very much. Muchas gracias, Dr. Rowe. Eh, ¿Alguna pregunta? Thank you, Dr. Rowe. Pretty, pretty nice presentation. We are trying to move right now into alpha modification in Costa Rica. Uh, we haven't used it very well. Maybe some SBRs have been used correctly, but not over the country. We, we, we've had several failures right now trying to modify the alpha binders. Uh, I want to ask you, where are you, as a fair question, where are you modifying the alpha binder? In the hot mix alpha plant or in a uh, refinery or with intermediate producer. This is very important to know. And if the people order just what they need, for example, I don't know, I want an alpha modified with an SVR, SBS, with El Baloy, with what is the process what, how, to, to order and modify a binder order? I think this is important to people here that is involved in the industry to, to understand that because basically we are, we are, we are just crawling trying to, to modify fossil binders in Costa Rica. Uh, it's a good question. Uh, with the time limits for this presentation, that was one of the slides I took out of my presentation was the, the options for modification. And, you know, if you look at the U.S., most of our modification is done either at refinery or in the terminal. And in most of the, um, I would say, more developed countries, you know, like Europe and the U.S. and other places, that's sort of how uh, the modification is generally done. Where I've also done modification is to work with uh, units that um, we attach to an asphalt plant. So there's several companies that make these units. Uh, they cost around about somewhere between $250,000 and $500,000. Uh, Mesenza is one of these uh, companies. Technomark is another one. You basically have two small um, uh, tanks of material with, or tanks of material with a high shear mill located between them. So you, you add bitumen into, in, into one tank, uh, you add your polymer in that, you pump it through a high shear mill maybe a, two, three times to blend the polymer in, and then you take that material and you put it into a digestion tank. So that will then go into a tank with uh, vertical um, uh, shafts with, with uh, agitators on there just to keep it in motion. Uh, we did that, um, I've done that in Turkey, Kazakhstan, and also Afghanistan, uh, when we did some of the implementation of the Kabul-Kandahar Road in Afghanistan. Uh, we wanted to use SBS polymer modification over there, uh, so we put in those uh, Mesenza units uh, to the asphalt plants over there, and we had contractors like Gulson and uh, Technomark, a few other folks working with those uh, people over there. And it was a very successful modification process. We implemented DSRs and uh, had those systems working over there. So that was trying to do it on a uh, plant-based, smaller scale uh, picture there. The slide I showed you with the lumpy asphalt we're in Turkey, we also had one of those uh, Mesenza units there, and we implemented that there. So this was, this was a, uh, a way of putting an SBS modification into an asphalt plant, uh, and you could do that with you know, things like polyethylenes, SBS, a whole bunch of other types of materials. Uh, you, you also commented on the SBR type production. SBR is a latex you can add into uh, a pug mill as a mixer box. And you know, in the UK, when I was working in the UK in the mid-1980s, early 1980s, we were doing that very commonly over there. We were taking uh, Polystar, which is now BASF, uh, S SBR products, about a 70% latex, 67, 70% latex, and adding that directly into the hot mix uh, plant 
into the pug mill, and that system worked very well for us. But you know, of course, you have to just be a little bit careful about you know all your quality control procedures for doing that. But there's a lot of things that can be done, um, and uh, there's what's also coming on the market now is several, uh, I would say, plant mix additive processes. So some of the uh, uh, finely ground crumb rubbers or SBSs are being combined with other materials, and they're being added as um, plant mix additives. Some of these look a bit like your Viotop pellets. So if you're familiar with Viotop, which is like the, uh, the pellet process they use in Europe for adding fibers, some of the manufacturers are putting their um, polymer pellet into that system because then they can be delivered through the, all of those feeders that exist at many asphalt plants. So, you know, if I look at different countries around the world, a lot of folks are set up for adding that type of material into a plant, into a pug mill. So, some folks that I know are also developing those systems as well. You also have the fiber blowing system, and in, in the US, uh, again, some polymer concentrates have been added through the fiber blowing systems, basically a blue box type system where you can blow fibers into a drum mix plant or a batch plant. So that's a long answer, but many I'm different fine. options. And I have another question because, well, I, I, I've seen in mostly in El Salvador and in Colombia, they are mixing various types of, of polymers in a single asphalt. A little bit like what you showed before. For example, they say we are going to put a wax to do this, and after that an SBS to do that. And I seen one in the Salvador airport, they put like six different things in the asphalt. So how common is becoming that in the world, or what is your experience about that? I would say it's very common to see people adding three, three components. Um, okay. You know, uh, if I look, say look at some engineered binders, you know, maybe you would be adding uh, an SBS, maybe you would be adding a little bit of oil to adjust the bottom end, maybe you'll be adding something for lubricity or mixing compaction as well. So I see very common Three, three components being used. I know people who, again, who are adding as many as five or six components in them. Some folks I've, I've worked with have been adding a, a bit of zinc oxide as antioxidants and, you know, other types of products to try to get certain effects. But, you know, one of the things we, we have to do is if you're adding a product, some of these products are quite expensive. You have to be able to quantify some benefit from them. Um, so it, it's a question of the whoever's doing the modification trying to justify what you're trying to do. Typically, I would say two or three products is, is more common in, in the market. Buenos días. Nosotros hemos trabajado con diferentes asfaltos modificados. con diferentes asfaltos modificados y sabemos que la linealidad de los asfaltos no existe, que el comportamiento es muy, muy variable y depende de los modificantes. Este, sin embargo, el BBR es uno de los equipos más variables. El Delta T Cracking se basa en los resultados de Stiffnet y dependiente del BBR. ¿Qué tanta incertidumbre introduce la variabilidad del equipo en el parámetro para poder calcular este la especificación. Uh, okay, the the question is very good. The the use of the bending beam rheometer defines the high stiffness properties of the asphalt binder. If you look at the ability of a rheometer to measure high stiffness, and the stiffness range I'm talking about here is 10 to the 5 pascals to 10 to the 9 pascals. So 10, um, 10 to the 5 is uh, 100,000 pascals to a gigapascal. The bending beam rheometer measures the higher part of that stiffness region. We can measure the lower part of that stiffness region with a DSR. What we find for the cracking parameters is that the cracking parameters within that stiffness range can be reasonably well characterized by the linear viscoelastic response within that range. Regardless of adding polymers or asphalt rubber, we see that the materials still exhibit 
reasonably good linear viscoelastic behavior within that range. So this is the first part. The first part of the answer is that we can qualify the linear viscoelastic behavior of the asphalt binder. The second part of this answer is if you need to judge the value of a modifier in terms of cracking resistance, we need something in addition to just the linear viscoelastic properties. We also need to know something about its failure characteristics. And for this, we need to have a failure test. In different parts of the world, we see different tests being used. For example, in, in Europe, um, I see a test which I quite like, which is the, uh, a test which they have as a cohesion test to classify a failure condition of an asphalt binder. They use that for chip seals or surface dressing binders, and um, that's something that is used in, in the industry. In the US, we have been exploring various tests, things like the double-edged notch tension test, and there's several other tests, the last test, and a few other tests, to try to define the failure condition of the asphalt binder. We haven't really fully developed that, those procedures yet, and we don't have a test for doing that. But this is something that's needed in addition to the linear viscoelastic parameters. So the BBR has a place, and the BBR place is to define the uh, high stiffness characteristics. It's a very good rheometer, very reliable rheometer. It's, it's fairly easy to use, and it's very repeatable in its test results. So I really think that even in a climate like this, it can bring value to what we're doing. Um, but we need to do some things in, in addition to that, and hopefully in the next you know, five to 10 years, we'll be working on that and developing some, some, some tests to classify the extra value that those materials bring in at, the, at, the, um, at the cohesion or when they break the ultimate property side of the test. Uh, Don Christensen and his co-workers are working on this, and there's a NCHRP projects looking at this at the moment in the U.S. Thank you. Someone at the back. Buenos días. Yo he trabajado con con asfaltos oxidados, y la forma en que el asfalto se fatiga no solo depende del módulo. Depende de la fragilidad que le da el cambio en la composición química. Eh, mi pregunta va en este sentido. Ya lo comentaba Ellen. ¿Cómo hacer, cómo visualizar nosotros, cómo relacionar, porque la relación no es lineal, del BBR a una fractura a temperaturas intermedias que sí se da? Incluso yo he trabajado con asfaltos eh, altamente oxidados, de, de más de, cinco, de cuatro ciclos, de PAF, Y estos asfaltos eh, se fatigan incluso a temperaturas donde esperamos deformación. ¿Cómo podemos nosotros cuantificar? ¿Cómo ven ustedes en este momento la, la fatiga a temperaturas intermedias? Ok, la pregunta es cómo cualificar el comportamiento oxidado en la behavior in fatigue and cracking at, at various temperatures and durability cracking. The fatigue cracking on oxidized binders, I think is reasonably well captured by the G star sine delta parameter that we have at the moment. If I look at the, the work done by uh, Mike Anderson at recent uh, expert task group meetings in the, U, in the US, he's presented a, a reanalysis of the verification effort. And this is okay for a certain amount of the fatigue that we see. It relates very nicely um, the parameter that we have with the fatigue behavior. With oxidized binders, generally speaking, we'll see lower phase angles uh, for a given stiffness. So this is, it will have a, a higher R value, lower phase angle. So we can classify that simply through this G star times sine delta parameter. With regard to durability cracking, the position of the delta TC and the, the Glover-Rowe parameter are going to be absolutely critical for the durability 
uh, cracking parameter, uh, durability cracking effects. What we don't know yet is we don't know how to apply those parameters in a climate like Costa Rica. Our validation work um, and the efforts looking at those parameters showed that those parameters work very nicely in a climate like Pennsylvania. Now, when we take the, the, the materials properties and we translate that through to Costa Rica, uh, we have a very different climate. So if we use those parameters here, and there's nothing that would say to me that those parameters should not work, but we will need to consider local calibration. So I think we need to maybe look at, say, um, areas where we have durability issues in Costa Rica and then see if we can change the, the numbers or even see if the same numbers work. But I would expect there to be some differences in, in the numbers from the USA to um, here in Costa Rica. The, the numbers we have for durability cracking uh, we've found to work fairly well in Europe, in Holland, in uh, uh, in, in areas which are basically, I would say, cold, wet climates in the northern hemisphere. Um, but obviously, it's not the same climate as you have here. Se lo digo porque, conforme uno baja la temperatura, el volumen libre del material disminuye. Entonces, a temperaturas muy bajas, es muy fácil encontrar fatiga porque no depende solo del cambio en la composición química, depende del volumen libre. Conforme el material se oxida y aumenta la temperatura, empezamos a tener más variables y el, y el proceso de fatiga es cada vez más complejo. A las temperaturas que nosotros tenemos, el fenómeno se da, pero es un fenómeno que es puramente por oxidación del material, no por, por la diferencia del volumen libre. Yeah, my, my comment would really be that many of these parameters, such as uh, free volume, oxidation, where these things occur, can be all related to each other. The, the chemistry and the oxidation will affect the position of the glass transition, will also affect the width of the glass transition zone, and we know that the width of these zones and the position of these zones significantly affect the behavior. I I'm, was very impressed walking around the laboratories here yesterday um, to see the amount of work that they're doing with uh, experiments such as DSC, um, which will, d differential scanning calorimetry, which will really help uh, define the width of some of those transition zones. And I think when we take some of that information and combine that with the rheology, and if they can include some of your oxidized binders, I think this will be a really big benefit to increasing the understanding of how these effects are, are all interrelated. 